Okay, welcome everybody. I hope that you can see, I hope that you can see my PowerPoint properly. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about horror stories from the field. I'm Dr. Mark Abrahams. So my first question to you, many of you may have thought about um, doing field work in the tropics and some of the images that might come to your mind may well look something like these beautiful shimmering waters gorgeous forests amazing wildlife you might think about all of those things when you consider when you think about field work well tonight i'm going to do my very best to disgust you and to absolutely put you off ever thinking of undertaking field work in the tropics so you should be warned that this presentation is going to include a lot of disgusting things. Gore, blood, poo, parasites, hospitals, creepy crawlies. Uh, and many of these pictures are my own pictures. So you're gonna see lots of my injuries, lots of my illnesses. Um, so you should be aware of that right now. And I'll try and maybe warn you a little bit in advance if any of the really nasty stuff's coming up, but I'll probably forget. So you've been warned, it's, this is how it's gonna be. And just before I continue with the talk, um, I wanna make something very clear, which is that, well, firstly, it's a huge privilege for me to have been able to do field work at all, but also when I do field work, I am in a position of privilege in which it's not too difficult for me to get to a hospital if I get sick, um, to have tests for malaria. Um, I've got ins I've, when I go on field work, I have insurance. I have a lot of equipment, and it just means that I have a lot of a lot of safety nets behind me. There are a lot of people that in, that live in the places that I'm going to don't necessarily have. So it's just important to recognize when, while you're listening to this talk that all of these things I'm telling you about, despite all of that, I've got lots of privilege when I'm going to these places. And the other important thing to mention is that the people that I work with are amazing. They're incredibly hospitable. Um, I'm talking about my personal experiences and these are people who live in communities in the rural tropics who almost universally welcome me into their communities and into their homes. Um, so when I do this talk, I'm not in any way trying to denigrate um, them or the way that they live. So please take, take some of this with a bit of a pinch of salt. I'm trying to ham it up. I'm trying to make it sound horrific. But actually, um, these are wonderful people and they actually live, live fantastic lives as well. It's important to remember. Oh, what just happened there? So, let's start by just welcoming you to what it's like to work in a humid tropical forest. It's incredibly hot, it's incredibly humid, you're generally walking through dense forest. Um, you sweat profusely. You're normally carrying lots of weight. So you might, if you're, let's say, deploying camera traps, you might be carrying a backpack full of camera traps and the associated batteries. Everything hurts. So you can see some of the delightful thorns in this picture that you have to go through. I had a, a saying during field work, every week, Sorry, every day, thorns and spines, every week, wasps, every month, a disease. And it would pretty much would go like that. I'd be picking out thorns and spines from myself at the end of every field work day. Almost without doubt, I'd have been attacked by wasps at least once a week. Um, and then in terms of weather, you contend with both very hot sunshine, which is fine when you're in the middle of the forest, although it's incredibly hot, but then when you get out of the forest onto the river, that's when you get lots of sunburn. And you're also exposed to very strong tropical storms. I should say, by the way, before I continue that, although I'm trying to make this sound as horrifying as possible, 
I realize that many of you are going through lots of horrifying stuff right now and that a lot of the things I'm going to talk to you tonight might not compare to all of the horrors that you personally are experiencing. But I'll do my best. I'm going to make it as horrifying as I possibly can. Next slide, please. There we go. Let's see if you can hear this. So this is what it's like when you're in a little boat on a river in the tropics in a storm. I have no idea how the person driving the boat could even see where he was going because I can promise you that I had to pretty much have my head down the whole time. This is in the high water season, so you can see the water levels coming right up to the edge of the forest. In this place that I was working, there's more than a 10 meter flood pulse. So there's huge areas of flooded forest at this time of year. So that's welcome to the jungle. But another important thing to remember is that you may well be living and working in a community and it might be something that you're not very used to. Um, so the first thing that I found personally, which may not sound like a huge thing, is that I was always somebody's guest. I should mention that a lot of, um, a lot of the stories that I'm going to tell you today are from uh, field work that I undertook during my PhD, um, which was in the Brazilian Amazon. But I am also going to show you images and tell you stories from my time working for Bristol Zoological Society. But this, but this um, set of images in particular relates to times when I was always a guest in a community. Um, and just psychologically, that meant that even though the people that I was working with were wonderful people, it's sometimes difficult to feel like you have time to yourself um, and that you're completely comfortable. Now I say work and you can see me sweating profusely and working hard, making farinha in a casa de farinha in Brazil. But I should say that no one was forcing me to do any of this. This is exactly what I wanted to be doing. I would always ask people, um, if there was anything that I could do and work with when I was living there. So you shouldn't feel too bad for me. Um, it was normal where I was working in the Brazilian Amazon to sleep in a hammock underneath a mosquito net. This picture you see in the middle, I actually strung my hammock up in somebody's Casa de Farinha, which is a, a flower making house. And the images on the left are a particularly rickety walk to a toilet that I had in one house and I've not got great balance. So, and also people's pigs were kind of foraging around and pooing uh, in all the thick mud underneath those um, boards uh, leading to that toilet. Another thing that if you go and work in the human tropics that you might not be used to is the food. Um, I was everybody's guest, which I already mentioned. And I was always hungry because I was working a lot in the, in the forest. And my rule was, if my hosts were eating it, I ate it. And that means that I ended up eating a lot of hunted meat and a lot of uh, fresh caught fish, which is what everybody around me was eating. That image in the bottom that you can see, those two images, that was a community where somebody had killed an anaconda that's the anaconda skin. And um, there's, there's a belief that the fat, the subcutaneous fat of snakes has medicinal value. And so they were gently boiling up the fat. And as they were boiling up the fat, these pieces of fat were crisping up. And that got offered to me as a, as a delightful meal. I enjoyed that greatly. Um, you can see an image of somebody preparing a turtle. You can also see an image of somebody preparing a lowland paca there. When you're actually out hiking in the forest, one thing that you'll eat a lot of is tinned food, which is totally fine for the first week, the first month, 
But when the months drag on, you've been eating lots and lots of tinned sardines. In this case, what you see in the image is chikwang, which is like a, a fermented paste made out, made out of manioc flour in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's, can you see the image there that says takaka gisela? That's takaka, which is, it's a wonderful meal from the Amazon. And when I first ate it, I hated it. It's a very hot, sour, tangy soup. It's got like prawns in the top of it. And it's got this vegetable called jambu, which makes your, makes your mouth numb as you eat it. What it's also got is manioc gum, which is kind of the consistency of snot. And that falls to the bottom of the soup. So when you've picked out everything else, you then drink the snot from the bottom of the bowl. In the bottom right hand corner of the screen here, you can see the most typical meal that I would eat in the Brazilian Amazon, which would be fish soup and farinha. So there would be fresh caught fish. Farinha is a flour made out of ground up manioc and it's absolutely delicious. I'm sure I'm telling you like this is a horror story, but believe me, the food is delicious. And acai, I can say is the food of the gods. It's wonderful. It's the fruit of, a, of an Amazonian palm tree and you collect it and you make it into this thick purple soup and you generally eat it with more farinha and maybe some sugar. And now it's become a huge health fad, but it's an Amazonian staple food. So that's some of the fun with food. Oh, and I should also mention that one of the interesting things about being a guest, for me at least, is that people were sharing their food with me and I was always starving hungry uh, because I was spending long days in the forest. And I was always worried about eating too much of people's food which always meant that I never ate as much as I really wanted to. So I was pretty much hungry a lot of the time, despite the fact that the people I was living with were incredibly hospitable. Another important principle for you to remember is that if something can go wrong in the field, it absolutely will. Everything from your camera traps. I was deploying camera traps. The first camera trap I ever got back, ants had managed to chew their way through the plastic into the camera trap. And if you've hiked out six kilometers into the middle of the jungle to deploy a camera trap, anything that gets broken is absolutely heartbreaking. Other things that may happen to you in the field are that if you're traveling over land, cars that you're driving in may well crash. If you're traveling by water, by boat, I can almost guarantee you that your engine will break down almost constantly. Another thing that might happen if you're an idiot like me and decide to drive your boat way up a little stream in the dry season is that your propeller blades will break off. When that happens, you're very lucky if somebody comes by in a canoe with a habeta, which is that engine that you can see being deployed there, to rescue you from your predicament. You'll find if you decide to work in the field that you will encounter lots of things that might be dangerous. Let me talk to you about some of those things that may be dangerous on land. So, um, what have I got? Onsa. So, onsa, so we've got uh, jaguars and pumas. So, in the Brazilian Amazon, jaguar is onsa pintada. Um, and the puma is a susuarana. And I'll tell you a nice little story about them. So what we used to do is hike out from a community, hike through all the people's fields and hike to the edge of the forest. And when we got to the edge of the forest, we would start hiking for six kilometers off into the forest. If we found a track that we could walk along, we'd walk along that. More than once, when we were walking back along the track towards the village, we would see tracks of big cats that hadn't been there um, when we had left hiking that morning. So it would seem that these big cats had been following behind us and we had never heard them. And there's a nice little Amazonian legend that goes along with that, that my field assistant, pardon me, that my field assistant told me. 
he said that he, he was talking about Jaguar in particular. He said that when a Jaguar hunts, it follows in the footsteps of its prey and it sniffs, sniffs the footprints to see how courageous the prey is. And if the prey is too courageous, then it doesn't attack. And then he was trying to flatter me and he said, oh yes. And it's clear that we're very courageous and that's why we've not been attacked. But actually, I suspect that nothing would have wanted to attack me at that point. I smelled terrible because I only had three sets of clothes. I had my day clothes that I wore in the field, which I wore every day. I had my night clothes that I wore in my hammock, and I had my spare set of clothes to uh, cycle through when I was washing any of the others. So I put on the same dirty, stinking clothes, wet, every morning when I went into the field. And that's probably why no Jaguar was attacked. Here's another nice Amazonian legend, the Mapingwari. The Mapingwari is like the Amazonian version of Bigfoot. It's a gigantic, hulking, hairy creature with a big, open, gaping mouth in the middle of its chest and one eye, and it lumbers through the forest, and it smells terrible, and it's surrounded by a cloud of insects, and you can find it in lots of Amazonian legends. And some people believe that this might be some kind of cultural memory of giant ground sloths that lived in the Amazon around about the time that humans were arriving there. But of everything that people were worried about in the forest, they weren't so worried about jaguars. They weren't so worried about Mapingwari. They weren't so worried about herds of white-lipped peccaries, which are these keshada, these pig-like creatures that you can see in the picture there. The thing that was most dangerous um, hiking through the forest um, was snake bite, bite, being bitten by venomous snakes. And I can tell you that if you're like me, unused to hiking through a forest and you're blundering your way in front with a GPS in one hand and a short machete in the other and not particularly looking where you're stepping. The likelihood of blundering into a snake, it's actually incredible that I never got bitten by one. Yes. But if you thought that peril on land was bad, in the water is so much worse. See this picture here of these kids having a delightful time swinging off a vine and jumping into water? These kids live in a community along a Blackwater River, which is by Amazonian standards relatively safe. It's generally understood that children who grow up next to white water rivers often never learn to swim. And the reason for that is that there are so many deadly things in the water that learning to swim is absolutely useless. If you fall off your canoe in the middle of the river, there's no way that you're going to make it to the banks. And the reason why you're never going to make it to the bank are from things like, so this is a black caiman, jacare asu. So people often think that caiman are some of the smaller crocodilians. Certainly they're smaller than saltwater crocodiles in Australia, for example. But the adult males grow bigger than five meters. They're definitely big enough to kill an adult human. No problem at all. And the way it often happens, see that idiot in the top of the screen who's hauling in a net? That's me. And I'm trying to haul in one of the, the world's largest, um, the world's largest freshwater fish, Piraruku. And what happens is that the fisherman is in their canoe, let's say, and their net has got loads of fish in, and the jacare, the caiman, is sitting on the bottom, and the fisherman goes over to haul up the net and the jacare comes up and grabs the fisherman, pulls him underwater and then that's the end of it. And lots of people die that way every year in the Amazon. But apart from that, the water are absolutely teeming, teeming with piranha, teeming with um, fish with very sharp teeth, teeming with, with huge catfish um, and with rays as well. You see that image of the, that is the bottom of someone's foot and they've been stabbed through the bottom of their foot by a ray. And that was, he said that that happened months before that picture was taken. So that foot seems like it might never heal. Now there's another Amazonian legend that you might have heard of. You might have heard of the Kanjiru. 
The kanjiru is this uh, fish that you see in the top right. It's a small parasitic catfish. And the legend goes that you should never pee into the Amazon because if you do, the kanjiru will swim up your pee into your urethra and lodge itself inside you. So goes the legend and it's not been substantiated. But one thing is for sure, these are parasites which are used to working their way into the gills and orifices of larger fish. So one thing that I've been told by Amazonians is that many of the horrific deaths that are attributed to piranha, those voracious fish with big teeth, are probably actually due to the horrific kanjiru making their way into people and eating them from the inside, which I think is much more horrifying. And speaking of things which eat you, we humans are not the top predators. We are prey. We are prey for the teeming masses of insects that live in tropical forests. Their diversity is absolutely incredible. I'm going to use some of the Portuguese words for these animals. So, carapana, which are the mosquitoes, and you can see that by my arms, and I'm not even somebody that gets bitten badly or reacts badly, that they eat you alive. Piuns, piuns are, are sand flies. There's a little, there's an image of a tiny little piun in the top right hand corner of the screen sucking my blood. And piuns are horrific because they're tiny and completely unstoppable. Anyone that's ever been, for example, to Scotland in summer and has had to contend with Scottish midges knows how bad the puins are. So you've got sand flies during the day, mosquitoes at night time. In the bottom of the screen there, you can see a tick feasting on my arm. In the bottom right, you can see a delightful leech. That particular leech was from Borneo. I was with a group of people and we decided that we were getting eaten so much by leeches that we may as well have some fun with it. So we had a leech growing contest. That one that you see there is a beautiful tiger leech, which has been grown to a beautiful big size. It's just gorging on his blood. And when they eventually drop off you, they've injected you with a substance, an anticoagulant to thin your blood. So you just keep bleeding from that wound for hours afterwards. These other two images that you see on the top of the screen, those are huge horseflies called mutukan, big old horseflies. And one thing that we used to do when we were hiking through the forest and it was horsefly season would be that we take turns to walk behind one another. So we take turns to be in the front and the person in the back, it was their job to slap the horse flies off each other's backs as we were hiking. So that image there that you see of the spider, that's something that makes me especially happy. I was walking behind my colleague one day and I slapped one of these mutukan off his back and it fell, it fell onto a nearby leaf and we had stopped hiking. And then that plucky little spider there, just jumped up and grabbed the thing and had it for his dinner. And then my colleague turned to me and he said, Ele jantando, jantando. He's having dinner. Oh, I was absolutely delighted to see that horse fly get eaten by that spider. Mm. And though there are lots of invertebrates that don't necessarily eat you, there are lots of others that can give you incredibly painful stings of various kinds. So I already told you that everyday spines, every week wasps, here are some images of, of the kinds of wasps I'm talking about. You're blundering through the forest like me. You have no idea what the heck you're doing. You have a machete in one hand and a GPS in the other, and you don't notice the wasp nest that's on attached to the branch that you're blundering your way through. And the next thing you know, you hear somebody from behind you scream, Kaba! And then you just run. Kaba just means wasp. And you just run as fast as you can through the forest because you know that if you don't, you're gonna get stung a lot. 
So wasps will absolutely sting you a lot. That blue fella that you see, actually that's a blue lady, I think. Um, that is a tarantula hawk. Their stings are reputed to be incredibly painful, even more painful than that bullet ant that you see on the top. You see that big lone ant there, about an inch long? That's called a bullet ant. So cold because the sting is painful enough that you feel like you've been shot. And there's lots of communities um, in the Amazon that weave baskets. They weave a gauntlet and they take bullet ants and sew the bullet ants into the gauntlet. And you put your hand in the gauntlet in your coming of age ceremony to be stung multiple times by bullet ants to prove that you can progress to adulthood. The image of that sea of ants next to it, that's from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have never been anywhere with so many painful, biting, aggressive ants. That's a swarm of army ants. And my malaria nightmare, because I used I take anti-malaria medication, which gave me some lovely hallucinogenic nightmares. My malaria nightmare was always to be swarmed over by these hordes of army ants. And then I was lucky enough for it to actually happen to me. I was lying in my, in my so actually, so this place in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I wasn't in a hammock, I was in a house. I was lying in my bed one night and I felt something pinch and I just brushed it off. And then again and again, eventually I turned my head torch on and they were swarming everywhere, all over the walls, the floors, the ceiling, mosquito net, everywhere. And after that, I never had that nightmare ever, ever again. That was nice. Ah. ah, But let's talk a little bit about spiders. So there's two nasty things that can happen to you with spiders. With the tarantulas, you see that big tarantula over there. They've got some lovely irritating hairs that they can slough off uh, and kick at you and go in your eyes. That other spider on the top right there, that's an armadera, an armored spider, or in English called a wandering spider. And I met somebody when I was in hospital who had been hospitalized by the bites of one of these spiders. They are, again, reputed to be horrifically painful. And there are, of course, scorpions. There are bombardier beetles, which will squirt a horrible substance which can get in your eye and cause temporary blindness. And if you thought caterpillars were cute, big furry caterpillars, the ones that sit themselves on branch, branches and you brush past them, they are also horrendously painful to touch. Each one of those little furry spines is full of nasty poison and venom, which just itches so much. And then, of course, apart from the wasps, there are bees. And even if the bees can't sting you, even the stingless bees are horrific. I remember one time I angered a group of stingless bees. I have no idea how I did it. But their method of attack on me was psychological warfare. As you may see, I'm relatively furry. And what the stingless bees do is they take a little bit of wax in their mandibles and their jaws and they fly at you and they stick themselves to your fur, to your head, to your beard, to your arms, everywhere. And they buzz manically. So you're covered in sticky, buzzing, angry bees. It's horrible. Mm. And then there's the even smaller things that can make you sick. And there are so many things in a tropical forest that can make you ill. On the left hand side, you can see the, way that, the ways that my feet rotted. In the Amazon, this is called hoi hoi. And basically what happens is, if you are walking around the forest every day in wet boots, and you're putting your, shoe, your feet into your wet socks and your wet boots every morning, eventually you start picking up this horrific infection which eats away at the skin of your feet. I mean, you can see how the water had basically rotted away my leather boots. And now you can see how the infection had basically rotted away the skin of my feet, which in that bottom picture is being feasted on um, by lots of little flies. Oh, and the reason I was wearing those plasters on my toes, by the way, that's because my toenails had fallen off um, from banging against the front of my boots. That was delightful as well. 
Ah, these two images on the right. I seem to be fairly susceptible to skin infections. And if you can imagine that you're getting lots and lots of itchy bites covering all of your body and you're itching them and they're bleeding and you're wearing dirty clothes every day, that's the best way to get a really lovely deep skin infection. And I had some real corkers. That skin infection that you can see on my, on my, uh, on my calf there, that was so painful that even though I had sprained my other ankle, it was less painful to walk on my sprained ankle than it was to walk on that infected leg. Ah, now let me tell you about the big three. This was a run of three illnesses that were absolutely delightful. Well, the first thing that happened is that I got malaria. Um, and that was delightful in so far as I had a headache and I was nauseous all the time and I was weak and I could hardly kind of stand up and walk around and I had no idea what it was. For two weeks I thought that I just had a cold um, and I never got diagnosed with malaria and I was just bedridden. Eventually somebody sensible said, you know what, you should, pardon me, you should probably get yourself to a hospital and get tested. And eventually I did, and eventually I did get diagnosed with malaria, but not before I had been diagnosed with lots of other parasites. I never even realized that I had. They treated all the other parasites first, and I didn't make any difference. And then they eventually treated me for the malaria. But another fun thing happened whilst I had malaria, and while my immune system was really down, I also managed to get toxoplasmosis at the same time. Now... Toxoplasmosis is not a disease that normally causes anyone any great troubles. It's something that a lot of people get if they've got cats as a pet. Um, cats uh, have it in their feces and lots of other species can catch it off cats. And it normally doesn't cause any big deal. But as my immune system had already been weakened by the malaria, the toxoplasmosis managed to make a lesion in the back of my eye. You can see that image there is actually an image of the toxoplasma, toxoplasma gondii eating um, the back of my eye. Um, and so they did eventually cure me of the toxoplasmosis through a lot of drugs, um, but that's left a nice scar in the back of my eye. So I'll never see again properly through my right eye. I have no central vision there. That's just a big old scar. And the really awesomely lovely third thing that happened, and I assume this is because of the cocktail of drugs that I was taking to fight off the toxoplasmosis, is I got a run of kidney stones. I had kidney stones perhaps three times in the course of a month or a month and a half. And twice, two of those three times, I wasn't in a city, I was in the forest. And so I couldn't get to a hospital. So I just had to take lots of painkillers and just wait it out, wait for the kidney scan to pass. They are also stomach churningly, horrifically painful. I was often lying in a ball on the floor, whimpering to myself, trying to pass the kidney stones. That was delightful. <laughs> yes. Now, I've got some stories that relate to some of those. Um, and so the next slides are going to have lots of disgusting images, including my poo and more insects and more parasites. So I'm just warning you right now, these images are about to get worse. So if that troubles you, then I suggest that you maybe look away for a second. So here's my poo. Why have I got pictures of my poo? That's because one time when I thought I had kidney stones, I wasn't really sure what was going on. All I knew is that I had this horrible burning pain and I thought it was maybe something to do with my poo. I didn't know what was going on. I was in the forest and I squatted down and I had, I had a poo in the forest, but the pain from the upcoming kidney stone was so great that I had to sit there for a good minute to just wait for the pain to pass. When I looked down at my poo, it was teeming with life. The poo was absolutely covered with flies, with the maggots that had been lain by the flies, with dung beetles that were coming to eat the poo. They were teeming. And I had this horrible moment where I thought, oh my God, 
did that come from inside me? I was fine. <laughs> but that experience did give me mm, something of a taste for working with dung and dung beetles. So these images here are from Equatorial Guinea, where I was studying dung beetles, and we were working again with human poo. We were creating baited pitfall traps to try and find dung beetles. Well, of course, dung beetles are attracted to dung, and we humans, being omnivorous um, and eating a very rich diet, our poo is very attractive to dung beetles. And so every night around camp, I would ask everybody who was working with me very politely to please donate their poo to me so that I could use it to find dung beetles. So as you can imagine I was in the middle of the rainforest in Equatorial Guinea speaking very poor Spanish to a load of Equatoguineans and trying to explain to them that I was giving them a plastic bag and I wanted them to put their poo into the plastic bag and give me the bag of poo so I could use it the next day to catch beetles. It didn't go down that well. I assumed that it must be because of my bad Spanish. David Fernandez, who's a native Spanish speaker, assumed the same thing. And so he reiterated what I'd said in Spanish. And it still didn't go down very well. Everybody just gave us blank looks. But every morning, um, the non Aquata Ghanaians would just hand me their poo in a bag. But every morning, one kind Aquata Ghanaian had left me a little bag of poo just hanging by my hammock. So one of them had wanted to give me their poo, but didn't want to tell me who it was. Now, isn't that just the most selfless gift? They didn't even want to thank you from me. Mm, so nice. Oh, gosh. Ha. I skipped on a bit fast there. I did warn you that it was going to be disgusting images. And this, this is a disgusting story. So let's imagine that you've had a horrific fieldwork season. And you think that you've encountered every disease and every parasite that the rainforest can throw at you. And then you go home. And then you go home. And in my case, after the plane ride home, I had spots on my bum. I was wondering, why do I have spots on my bum? And I thought, it must be because I've just been on a long, sweaty plane journey. It's fine. And I just, I ignored it. Months later, the spots on my bum were still there. And I couldn't see them. So I decided to go, into, go in and see the nurse um, and let her have a look at my bum so she could see why I had spots on my bum. And well, obviously, the first thing is she just, I, I, I took my trousers down and showed her my bum and she said, oh, you've got fungus on your bum. That's nice. So I had taken a lovely fungus, which had then lived on my bum for months after I had left field work. But then another delightful thing that happened was that she wanted to take a urine sample from me and a stool sample. So I went into the bathroom um, to, to, to give the urine sample and the stool sample. And when I had my poo, yeah. You guessed it. There was something on top of my poo, and it kind of looked like an earthworm. And I was wondering, what the heck is an earthworm doing on top of my poo? So, of course, I did what anyone would do. I took some toilet paper in my hands, and I gently lifted the worm off my poo. And I took it back and proudly showed the nurse what it was. And she very kindly took it from me um, and took it for sampling. And it was a roundworm. So I had brought back from me all kinds of delightful presents from the forest. I had brought back fungi and worms. It was amazing. Oh, these aren't my photographs, by the way. I forgot to take pictures of my bum fungus or my poo worm. I'm sorry about that. I'll try and do better next time. But despite all of that, um, it really is all worth it. You get to work with a load of fantastic people if you do field work in the tropics. Um, you get to experience some incredible wildlife. You get to do amazing things like climbing palm trees to harvest acai, like, like going in the middle of the Democratic Republic of Congo um, through tiny villages in the forest. You work with incredible partners, incredible local NGOs, incredible local communities, incredible colleagues from your home country. Um, 
and I guess most importantly, you hope that everything that you're doing is having a big conservation impact. And that's one of the reasons why I'm incredibly privileged to do what I do. I feel incredibly privileged to work for the Bristol Zoological Society. Um, you can find the Bristol Zoological Society Conservation Master Plan, which will tell you some more about the kinds of conservation work that we do and the kinds of impact that we hope to have. I also still work um, with the with the Major Juruá project from the Brazilian Brazilian Amazon, which is now the Instituto Juruá. So you can look up Projeto Medio Juruá the Medio Juruá project, and you can find out about a lot of the amazing conservation work that they still do in the Brazilian Amazon, working with communities um, for win-win solutions for conservation. It's amazing stuff. So, with all that being said, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for joining me for, for this Halloween talk. I'd like to thank the Bristol Zoological Society, who are my employers. I want to thank all the incredible people that I've worked with throughout this time and all the people that have funded me, the people that have supervised me, the governments and the NGOs in Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, the Philippines, all the amazing places that I've had the privilege to work in. And so now I think it's question time. So I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen. Welcome everybody, how are you doing? Not too badly traumatized, I hope. You can share your videos now, you can say hi, come and say hi. And I'm gonna monitor the chat. Hello everyone. So feel free to type messages in the chat. So if you want, you can type a message um, or you can say something. Ah, here we go, from Claire Pitt. Is it bad I'm nostalgic? You mean, is field work bad? Field work's incredible. As long as you don't mind everything eating you, field work is fantastic. Molly, currently at uni. How do I get into something like this? Hmm. Well, you can do lots of voluntary work. So there are lots of... Um, really good conservation projects that you can volunteer for. You can pursue a career in wildlife conservation um, and you can try and do field work as part of your career. There are, lots of, um, there are lots of different ways that you can get involved. I guess the most straightforward way is to join a paid group of people that are doing conservation research um, as a volunteer, but obviously that's incredibly expensive and at the moment it's probably very restricted, but that's one way of doing it. But feel free to send me an email. My email address is mabrahams at bristolzoo.org.uk and we can maybe discuss that a bit further because Bristol Zoo has lots of projects that you could potentially be involved in. Um, Victoria Ash asks, what was my area of study? And um, I've studied lots of different things. When I was in Brazil, I was studying subsistence hunting. So I was studying the impact of um, subsistence. So people hunting to, to eat, not hunting um, for trophies or hunting to sell the meat. And I was studying the impact of that on the fauna. So I was using camera traps to see what kind of fauna you could find around these hunting communities. Um, and deep in the forest. Um, but I've also done a lot of work doing spatial analyses, um, interviewing hunters. And in my time in Bristol Zoo, I've worked with our Philippines project, looking for critically endangered Negros bleeding heart doves. So really a very wide variety of things I've been involved in. Becky asks, when having hit a low, have you ever thought about maybe I should have stayed home? Yes all the time what i tended to find was a terrible well a difficult thing would happen and i would say to myself i can't take this anymore i'm going to i'm going to keep going just this one more time but i can't take this like especially when i had that run of really nasty diseases like the malaria was bad and then the toxoplasmosis was really bad and i was like okay i'm part blind like this is horrific i can't keep doing this and then I got the kidney stones. I was like, this is incredibly painful. I can't keep doing this. But all you do is every time that it happens, you say, I can't keep doing this, but I'm just going to keep doing it this one more time. 
And then you find that you just keep doing it forever and you never stop. Um, so yeah, I did think that all the time. Which location, um, so which location in the Amazon was I working in? I was working in two regions of the Brazilian Amazon. One was a white water river called the Juruá, which is an incredibly sinuous um, white water river which drains from the geologically young Andes. So the river carries a lot of nutrient rich sediment which enriches the soil um, in those white water floodplains, which is why these are incredibly productive fisheries, have incredible wildlife, but the water is also not particularly acidic and therefore the area teems with insects. And I also worked in the Watuma region of the Brazilian Amazon which is a black water river, which drains from geologically older areas. So the water is a tannin thick tea like substance, which is slightly acidic, which kills off a lot of the mosquito larvae and sandfly larvae, which means that you get eaten a lot less working in a black water river. Stephen Hughes asks, is there a particular area, place or country you would recommend as a first time tryout? That's really hard. I'm going to restrict myself to the to the tropics. I'm going to restrict myself to tropical forests because that's where I've got most experience. But of all of the tropical regions, I honestly can't say that I love any of them any more than any others. I love them all dearly. Um, they're places that are incredibly dear to me. And I really wouldn't want to choose favorites and say, even though that I spent much longer in the neotropics in South America, I still wouldn't want to say that I love the neotropics more than let's say the Afrotropics or the Congo Basin, or let's say the tropics in Southeast Asia. I think they're all incredible. Um, and the flora and fauna is, is equally magical and amazing. Let's see from Becky. Did your project partners get the same amount of diseases problems, or do you think you were especially susceptible to trouble? <clears throat> I seem to be susceptible to certain things more than other people. So I definitely got more skin infections than other people. And that might have been due to my disgusting hygiene habit. I just wasn't staying in one place for very long. I wasn't washing my clothes very much. So maybe that's why I was getting lots more skin infections. But I got far fewer. Um, I got far fewer stomach infections. Um, I didn't get leishmaniosis, uh, lush which other people got. Um, I think I actually got around about the same number of diseases as, il as illnesses as everybody else. I think I would say that anybody who grows up in a place seems to get a certain degree of immunity to a lot of the illnesses that, that are out there. So I found that for the first few months in the Brazilian Amazon, I was definitely picking up more illnesses. After a few months, I tended to find that, um, that it wasn't as bad. Same with insect bites. I found that I reacted much less strongly to insect bites after a while of living there. Um, so yeah, so mm, bits of both. <laughs> Let's see, whatever else is there. Another message. What kind of, so Victoria Ash asks, what kind of medical services are available in the Amazon for you and for local people? So it's a case of um, escalating things depending on how bad they get. So if you're out in the forest far away from anyone, then the only medical service that you have is yourself and any medical kit that you might carry. So if you can imagine that if you're a, if you're a six kilometer hike through a forest away from a village, which might be a day's drive along the river to the nearest city, then you better make sure that you've got some kind of medical kit with you and that you're being careful as much as is possible. When you get to a community, if you're lucky, other people might have some medical supplies there, but probably not. So if things are bad, 
then you'll have to escalate and drive yourself to a small city. The biggest, the small city that was close to me in the Jurua was called Karawari, and they have hospitals that are free to use. So that's the first place that I went when I got really ill and didn't know that I had malaria. But their malaria tests showed up negative. So I waited in, in Karawari for a week, thinking I didn't have malaria when I did. So after a week of still not getting any better, a doctor said to me, look, you have to, you have to go to a bigger city and get another test. So at that point, I, f I got myself to Manaus, which is the capital city of the state of Amazonas. And there they have very good tropical hospitals which are also um, free to the public. And there I got a malaria test, which showed that I did indeed have malaria. That's also where I got treated uh, for my toxoplasmosis eye infection. So it's a case of just escalating things depending on how bad they get and just getting yourself to the nearest hospital if things get really bad. Cat Jones asks about hunted animals. Were there any situations where you felt that you were in an awkward ethical situation, knowing the situation of the species? Yes, absolutely there were. So I definitely was in a situation where I was eating species which were of conservation concern. I was staying in people's houses and whatever they ate, I ate. And yes, that was definitely a moral, a moral quandary. Um, so I'll give you an example. There was this was a really bad. This was a this was a bad situation. Um, I was in a community where somebody had killed a giant otter. I had no idea. Well, giant otters are persecuted by people. Um, because it's thought that they steal fish from people's nets. So a lot of fishermen don't like giant otters and will kill them. This individual had actually killed the giant otter because he wanted to skin it and use the pelt. Um, but we weren't going to waste the meat. If he had killed it, we were going to eat it. Um, I just felt really bad that, I guess I felt like this is a species of conservation concern. And it really didn't need to be killed. Um, having it as a, as a pelt for a trophy didn't seem to me personally like a thing which justified the killing of it. Whereas I can, I can understand much more if you're living in a rural community um, and a herd of peccaries comes past your community, let's say a herd of white-lit peccaries, and you want to kill some white-lit peccaries and that's going to feed your community from a, for a long time. Um, I was, you know, that I was much more fine with. But I, I decided that if I was studying hunting and if I was going to live and work with people and live and work with hunters, then I wasn't going to refuse to eat the things that the hunters were catching in those communities. That was my, that was my judgment and other people I'm sure would make different ethical judgments to me. Okay, Becky asks, have you ever encountered human attacks of some sort? Now, do you mean, I assume that you mean, well, you could mean two things. You could mean animals attacking humans, or you could mean humans attacking humans. I'll give you examples of both. Um, yes, there were definitely times, uh, humans attacking humans. Yeah. So the, the biggest example I have of that was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, which has had a horrifically violent history, mostly due to horrible colonial oppression. Um, and the country is still suffers from a lot of violence to this day. And I was in, I was working in the uh, Okapi Formal Reserve. Um, and I was staying in, um, in like a research station in that reserve. And apart from some violent stuff that I encountered, I got like um, I got kind of uh, stopped by um, by the army a few times when I was driving around and kind of held up. But that like that was okay; it wasn't too bad. But the whole research station a year after I was there got burned to the ground um, by rebels. So a group of rebels came, attacked the research station, burned it to the ground, um, and everybody had to flee into the forest. Uh, and hide in the forest. So that's definitely a thing that, that happens, yes. 
Yeah. Thankfully, I've not had it that often. Um, most people have been incredibly uh, warm and welcoming and gentle um, with me and with people that I've worked with. So I have not experienced much violence for myself. Well, I think, I think we're nearly ready to wrap this up. So thank you everybody for joining me tonight. Thank you for joining me on this Halloween episode, Horror Stories from the Field. Now, we have the last conservation lecture of the year is going to be our annual alumni awards. And I'm gonna make announcements in the coming weeks about when that's gonna be um, and about what the topic is and about who's gonna be speaking. Um, and that's gonna be our big conservation talk for the year. Um, so please do join us for that. I really look forward to seeing you there. Until then, have an incredibly happy Halloween. And yeah, it's been lovely to see you.